You know, Chris, you have, as I mentioned earlier, really um, written so much about the darker side of nature and human nature, and you've immersed yourself in it. You've really spent a lot of time with people, understood their stories, uh, written about their pathologies. And it's a personal question, but have you, do you have, where do you find hope from when you see all of that? I mean, do you find hope? I, I, I think having spent 20 years outside the United States in societies that are being rent apart by violence, I don't quite share America's mania for hope. Um, when I covered the war in El Salvador, when I covered the war in the former Yugoslavia, it was standard practice for the Salvadoran military, or in the case of the former Yugoslavia Serbian paramilitaries, to go into villages and carry out massacres. And then they would block the roads. So both in El Salvador and in Bosnia, we had to walk in, in, in the case of Yugoslavia with our satellite phones. Uh, the Serbs were, would often have snipers firing on us because they didn't want the massacre reported. And it was the ability to document the atrocity, to give the victims names on the front page of the New York Times often, that was victory enough, that was hope enough. It didn't mean that I wouldn't get up a few days later and do the same thing again. And we did this at tremendous risk in Sarajevo alone, 45 foreign journalists were killed. Dozens were wounded. And I think, as I mentioned with my students, that freedom and that hope is embodied in the act of resistance. Most of the great rebels in history, Malcolm, Martin, Sitting Bull, did not succeed in the eyes of the power elites. But as the theologian James Cone writes, faith is about inverting the world's values. I, I once had dinner with George McGovern, and as a teenager, I had spent the summer working for him uh, in his campaign. And at the dinner, he, I, I told him about what he meant to me. I think I was 15 or something at the time. And he made a comment at the dinner about losing 49 states. And I said, yes, but you never betrayed that 15-year-old boy. And I, I think that those of us who come out of traditions of faith have to have a different concept of time. We're all mortal. Injustice will exist long after we are gone. But it is these invisible witnesses, these magnificent figures who rise up in moments of extremity to do what is right, even at the cost of their own life. And I think for those of us who follow it is about not betraying them. And that, for me, keeps hope alive. And, you know, there's a scene in the, uh, you know, at the end of the Christian Gospels when Jesus is abandoned by everyone. I mean, the crowd turns on him, his disciples flee, everyone abandons him. And, but three weeks later, the disciples are picked up, brought before the court of the Sanhedrin, and... Uh, if they profess faith, they will be condemned to death. And they do. And for me, that is an example of the power of the moral of the spiritual life. That is the true, in the Christian faith, example of resurrection. And as Hamsa knows, I was very close to my father, who was an anti-war activist, a civil Presbyterian minister, and so forth, but who was pushed aside by the institution itself because of his stances. 
And that for me was a very good lesson because I grasped that no institution, even the one you had dedicated your life to, will ever reward you yeah. for doing what is right. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because I remember I had a conversation with you on the phone and, uh, you know, I, uh, you, you said your, that your father taught you a very important thing, which was virtue is its own reward. Yeah. And, and it really hit home for me for the first time, I think, oddly enough, the power of what that actually means, um, which is in the Quran. Hal jaza'u al-ihsan illa al-ihsan. Is the reward of virtue anything other than virtue? Yeah, well, you, as you know, I came back from the Middle East, where I'd been the Middle East bureau chief for the New York Times. There was this mania after 9-11 for invading Iraq. It was a very lonely time for those of us who were denouncing the calls to invade Iraq. And I was booed off of a commencement stage. And it, I got lynched by the right-wing media. And the way they lynch you is hour after hour after hour, day after day. <laughs> right, you've been there. And so I'm finally brought into the New York Times and I'm given a formal written reprimand saying I'm not allowed to speak about the war in Iraq anymore. And under guild or union rules, you give the employee the written reprimand and the next time they violate it, they can fire you. Can fire you. And I remember walking, and of course I was going, I left, I wasn't going to not speak. But I remember walking out of the newspaper and I think articulating for the first time what it was my father had given me. And that was freedom. I didn't need the New York Times to tell me who I was. I knew who I was. I was my father's son. And that is the power of hope. It's the power of resistance. And ultimately, for me, it's the power of faith. You know, about what you just said about um, that you don't um, believe in the, the kind of hope, this American hope, but I think that, and that was a distinction in the verses that were read. Um, false hope is, you know, the, the scholastic called it presumptio. You know, it was the presumption um, that God will grace us because he has to. And, and, uh, it's interesting because I think Augustine said that despair and false hope equally killed the soul. Yeah. They both had the same effect. And one of the things in our tradition, hope, which is raja, uh, is very different from false hope, which is umnia. And, and, and the Prophet Muhammad said that the etymological relationship of the word raja is it's related to to return which goes back to the idea of of the wayfarer the person on a path and i think as as long you know one of the things that recently somebody in hollywood said you know the afterlife's a hustle but for those of us who take it very seriously that actually believe that there is a day of judgment you know socrates says you know you might box my ears off in this life right but there's, there's gonna be a judge in the next world that, I and mean, he goes to the religious argument after he realizes the rational argument won't work with this man. And I think despair will, it will happen when people lose sight of the day of judgment. And that's why to believe that there really is ultimate justice, that every person, even in our tradition, the animals will have their day uh, on the day of judgment. So even animals that were wronged will be able to get their right on that day. The earth is raised up and will testify against those that oppress. The rivers will testify against those that polluted them. That this is, this is all in our tradition. And to believe that, that I and mean, that's what gets me up, you know, to pray Fajr. I mean, that, that's literally what gets me up, is that I believe that. I don't think it's a hustle, and I don't think it's a hype. And I think that despair, this idea of natural hope and and, and supernatural hope uh, that, that Pieper talks about, despair comes in when you, when you have natural hope. Natural hope is, is something young people have because they have a future. But supernatural hope is, is something that grows with age as you get closer to your destination. And we actually see this as one way station on a much longer journey because there's, there's stations after this life, at, just like there were stations before it. And so 
we're passing through, like you said. And I think if, if you lose sight of the, 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 the pilgrim nature of existence and that the destination has been promised and it's a real destination, and it's not this, you know, uh, Joe Hill's pie in the sky, you know, or piety in the sky it is, my friend puts it. You know, it's not, it's real, and we believe it. And I think that's, that's the difference. That's why you will find that people that do have a deep faith in this, they don't despair. The Quran says, لا تيأسوا من روحي لا. Do not despair of God's grace. Mm -hmm. The only people that despair of God's grace are disbelieving folk, the people mm -hmm. that lose belief. And forgiveness is part of that It's a also. deep part of it, yeah. Well, oh, my servants who... Which is in that verse. Because, transgress yeah. their soul. Don't despair of God's mercy. Verily, God forgives all sins. I, I think uh, resistance and hope is also something we owe to future generations. Because uh, the Sufis talk about medet, or this sort of spiritual energy that's generated in the past, that's transferred into the future. And... Recently, I was reading uh, Rupert Sheldrake, the biologist, the British biologist. He has this idea of morphic resonance. resonance. Mm. And to, to me, and I mean, he researches it, but I'm, I was thinking about things such as hope or resistance that are in, exist in the world because there are human beings such as Dr. King or Malcolm X or Gandhi or whoever who are Amir Abdul Qadir, Jazairi, who Chris generated Hedges. Chris Hedges, but he's, he's an heir of it. And what I'm talking about is we've inherited this. Yeah. You inherited it from your father. It's not physical. That's not something physical he gave you. It's metaphysical. Yeah. And collectively, the resistors and the hopeful will generate that energy that will translate this to future generations. And if we stop, there's nothing, to, the chain is broken. We say in our religion that Islam is dependent on chains of narration. And were it not for these chains, anyone could have said anything and attributed it to Islam. And were it not for the, this energy that we generate and we pass on, and, and we therefore keep it alive in the world, it will perish. And I think for a lot of people it has perished, but it is there. And I think we can strengthen it, we can enhance it, and we can give a, a wealthy, healthy inheritance to those coming after us. Mm -hmm.